welcome to Modern Life is Goodish, where I am here with my remote control, my big screen, and my laptop. Uh, but unfortunately, I want to start this show with a warning. Because later on, I'm going to tell a joke that uses the words fear change. And I want you to know that I don't want to tell that joke. I'm only telling that joke accidentally. It is an unavoidable joke. Please do not judge me for that joke. <laughs> Warning ends. Now, I am, I suppose, ladies and gentlemen, a, a man who sort of fears change in, in some ways myself. I know I seem like I'm kind of technologically savvy with my laptop on stage and stuff, but I like the simple pleasures in life. Uh, for example, recently, I was in the bath. I was having a lovely time. It was warm, it was luxurious. And my darling wife, Mrs. Gorman, was sitting on the toilet beside me. <laughs> and we were just chatting, and I was just so in love with her and with the moment and with the surroundings, because that level of intimacy is a beautiful thing. And this is real intimacy here. People usually think that the rude things are the most intimate things, but they're not. Because realistically, we all know that while you shouldn't, you probably would on a first date, but nobody would ever do this on a first date. <laughs> you just wouldn't. No, when someone says, do you want to come in for coffee? They might mean, do you want to come in for coffee? Or they might mean something else. But they definitely do not mean, would you like to come in for a bath while I sit on the toilet next to you? Huh? <laughs> This has never happened on a first date. So this is genuinely, it's kind of the most intimate you can be. Anyways, I'm lying there, sitting about, I'm enjoying it. It's almost trance-like. I'm in my own little space. I wasn't really engaged with what Mrs. Gorman was saying. And then suddenly, I knew that it was my turn in the conversation. <laughs> because I could hear Mrs. Gorman saying, so anyway, what do you think? And what I didn't say was, I think right now, it looks like you're riding a motorbike and I'm in the sidecar. Um, it, which is what I wanted to say. It is what I wanted to say, but it's not what I said. Especially because she was doing the sound effects. So, that... <laughs> she wasn't really. She wasn't really. I checked in with Mrs. Gorman. I asked her for permission to tell this story. She said, you can, but you're not lying about me making the sound effects. <laughs> The point is, I'm in the bath, Mrs. Gorman's on the toilet, and she says, so what do you think? And I said, I think you are 100% correct. And she said, oh, that's the thing I love about us. Every year just gets better than the last, doesn't it? And as much as that melts my heart to hear that from the woman I love, it's also, if you think about it, really intimidating. <laughs> That means she wants next year to be better than this year, and the year after that to be better again. And you can't keep getting better. Wouldn't it be okay if we just plateaued for a while? Yeah. <laughs> Can we not just think, well, this is nice, let's have this, let's settle for this. This is the thing, I'm genuinely a bit insecure about this with myself and Mrs. Gorman, because she likes things to be nice, whereas I just like things to be. <laughs> And there is a difference between the two. Mrs. Gorman is the kind of person who likes a gravy boat. I don't understand a gravy boat. There's sometimes, it's just me and her in our own kitchen, right? I don't eat meat and she does. So sometimes we'll cook a meal, sort of two different things, and I'll make some veggie gravy. Just like gravy granules, kettle, in a little jug, whisk it around. That's me. I'm about to pour it on my own dinner. It's just me, and it's just her with me in our kitchen. That's the only two people going to be engaged in this activity. And just as I'm about to pour it, she says, no, no, don't do that. And she takes it away from me and pours it into a gravy boat. <laughs> Look, I made that in that jug. I know what it is. And we carried it to the table, and then I had to pour it onto my own dinner <laughs> from a gravy boat. I don't understand. And incidentally, why is a gravy boat called a gravy boat? Doesn't that fundamentally misunderstand the relationship between liquids and boats? <laughs> What's going on there? There's nothing like a boat, is it? That's, that's what you do with a gravy, but that's not being at all boat-like, is it? That would be boat-like, wouldn't it? That would be boat-like. No. Mrs. Gorman didn't like me doing that. Because it's not nice. She likes things to be nice. And I, I genuinely think there is great pressure in the idea that you should constantly strive for improvement, to always try and make things better. What if things are perfect? When things are perfect and you keep meddling, you make them worse. 
I think the human condition is to constantly think we can improve everything. And basically, all we are is children with a set of felt-tip pens. We don't know when to stop colouring in. That's all it is. This, is. this is a child's drawing in four stages. Nobody in their right... If I ask you for your favourite, nobody in their right mind would say anything other than that or that. It's definitely not that. That is shit. <laughs> But that's what happens if you don't take the felt tips off a child. Some things we have to accept have reached perfection. Food, food is one of them. Do you know how many cookery books are published each year? No? I don't know either. But I know it's too many because food is finished. We have completed the Epicurean adventure of food. Every single conceivable edible ingredient has been cooked in every conceivable, imaginable way with every other conceivably edible ingredient. We have established for ourselves which ones work together and what is the best way of cooking them. There is no new recipe going to emerge ever again in our lives. We have finished food. And yet, they continue to develop food. They are basically kids colouring in with felt tips. And we should tell them, stop playing with your food. <laughs> I was in the park the other day. This is proof, right? I was in the park the other day. Nice sunny day. I wanted an ice cream. I was queuing up at the van to get something. And look what I saw. Have a look at that. Look at that. Zoom it. Look. What on earth? That. <laughs> that is a child who hasn't stopped colouring in, isn't it? That's what that is. I mean, I can, see, I can see why the first one is called Bat and Ball, that makes sense, but the other one, that shouldn't be called Bat and Ball, that should be called a surfing ghost. Hang on. <laughs> That's not better, is it? All they've done is make ice cream more inconvenient. The only thing they could do to make that worse would be reverse it and stick a lolly in an ice cream, wouldn't they, really? But they're doing that as well, of course they are, look at that! What a ridiculous idea! This one's called the Popeye. Presumably, because if you try and eat it, you pop your eye out. I mean... <laughs> It was ridiculous. You can see though, this one, £2.50. These, also, both £2.50. I think that, ladies and gentlemen, is conclusive proof. Cones are free. <laughs> no other explanation. Food is definitely finished. If you want more proof, I've got more proof. Pizza Hut, now do a pizza with a sausage in the crust. <laughs> Stop it! They also do a pizza with burgers in the crust. <laughs> pizza was perfected a long time ago. You are Pizza Hut. Your job is to keep trying to make pizzas as nicely as you can in your huts. That's it. <laughs> this is like saying, I'll tell you what, some men like tits, some men like cars. Let's put tits on a car. <laughs> no. No. Although it's ever so faintly depressing that I can feel some people over there going, oh, I don't know. <laughs> It could work. <laughs> I walk past an advertising hoarding on my way to the local train station about four or five times a week. I see that. Recently, that's it. That's the advert I've been seeing. Weetabix in a bottle. The way I see this, ladies and gentlemen, there are two options. Either this is not made out of Weetabix, or it is made out of Weetabix. And if it's not made out of Weetabix, don't bloody well call it Weetabix. <laughs> If it is made out of Weetabix, what the hell are they doing making a drink out of the driest substance <laughs> known to man? Uh, uh. I'll have a pint of Weetabix and a sand chaser, good sir. <laughs> ridiculous. It's a ridiculous idea, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You don't look like a kind of sand drinking man, sir, if you don't mind me saying. Just a quick question. Where do you stand on the tea-coffee debate? Everyone's on one side or the other. Are you a tea man or a coffee man? Tea man. Tea man. Are you, sir? Coffee. Coffee, tea, coffee, 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 coffee tea. tea, tea, tea. Oh, it's weird because I quite like both. You lot are really partisan. That's really, <laughs> that's really odd. I'll tell you what though, in my lifetime, trying to improve coffee has made tea get worse. Coffee is responsible for ruining tea. And I will tell you why I think this after the break. And frankly, if a man promising to deliver his thesis on how coffee has ruined tea doesn't bring you back, I don't know what will. <laughs> Gentlemen, this is Modern Life is Goodish, where we have been discussing the futility of constantly seeking improvement. Now, before the break, I promised to explain how coffee has ruined tea. 
I want to be very clear here. I am not saying that you can't get a good cup of tea in Britain anymore. You can. It's just that it's becoming harder to do so, especially in some places. And I include train stations in that list. Evidence for the prosecution, Exhibit A. Ladies and gentlemen, that <laughs> is not a cup of tea. That is, at best, a potential cup of tea. <laughs> and they were trying to charge nearly three pounds for that. Three pounds and they can't even be bothered to finish the job. That's like asking for some chips and being given a potato. <laughs> and let's be clear, that isn't even all the ingredients for a cup of tea. More to the point, what ingredients are there are not being assembled in the correct order. Allow me to demonstrate with a scientific experiment that I conducted under laboratory conditions in my own kitchen. That there, ladies and gentlemen, is two glasses. In glass one, there is boiling water. Above glass one, there is a tea bag. In glass two, there is a tea bag. Above glass two, there is boiling water. Let's see what happens when we combine the same ingredients, but in two different orders. <laughs> As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, in one of these glasses, we have made tea. And in the other, we have made not tea. <laughs> or, as we scientists call it, piss. <laughs> but this is only the first of my objections to this cup of potential tea. I would now like to move on to the topic of temperature. Tea and coffee are different drinks. They should be treated differently. For coffee, the water should be between 90 and 95 degrees. Whereas for tea, the water should be heated to between 96 and 100 degrees. And there is a reason for that, as close to boiling as possible for tea. This isn't me being a fusspot, this is actual science. Boiling water brings out the bitter, unpleasant flavours of coffee. Boiling water is needed to bring out the desirable flavours of tea. Now, it is because the water in that cup hasn't boiled, because they haven't boiled it, a borrower could have a bath in that cup. <laughs> And because it hasn't been boiled, and because they haven't put the tea bag in first, I am going to have to mash that tea bag to within an inch of its blessed life in order to squeeze any semblance of flavour from it. The ideal implement for that would be a teaspoon. Unfortunately, they haven't given me a teaspoon. They've given me that. What use is that? That, as far as I can tell, is only useful for lighting a high school Bunsen burner. <laughs> Is that the point? If I miss something, am I meant to seek out a Bunsen burner in the train station and boil the water myself <laughs> in another contraption and then pour it into the cup and then add the tea bag? How has tea been brought to this parlour state? I'll tell you how. It is because of machines like this. This is a beautiful machine. It is exactly what you need to make an excellent cup of coffee. But something like this will cost you in the region of two and a half thousand pounds. Whereas what you need to make a good cup of tea is one of these. <laughs> and you can get one of those for in the region of six pounds. <laughs> you need to train someone to operate one of those. If you need to train someone to operate one of those, they shouldn't have left the house. <laughs> now let me show you how one has interacted on the other. I'll do that using my cost versus quality analysis of hot brown drinks over time graph. Uh, obviously brackets, not including hot chocolates. Um, if we map the price on the horizontal axis, ladies and gentlemen, and the quality of the brown drink on the vertical axis. Now, 20 odd years ago, when I was a young man, it was pretty much impossible to get a bad cup of tea. It was always of a high quality, and it was always relatively cheap, 30, 40, 50p for a cup of tea. Coffee, however, um, it was similarly priced, 30, 40, 50p, but it was pretty abysmal. It was instant, it was burned, we didn't know what we were doing. Britain was a very naive place, coffee-wise. It needed to be improved, and good on them, they improved it, but at a cost. They took it up to a high price, high quality item. And if things had stayed there, that would be fine, because what you've got there is one high quality, low price item, and one high quality, high price item. But they weren't happy with that. They thought, we can't put tea and coffee on the same menu, serving one of them for 50p and one of them for £3. But because 
They've used one of these to make the coffee. They've got to justify the cost of that. So they've dragged the price of tea up towards the price of coffee. And even then, if things stayed there, at least they'd both be acceptable things. But no, because they're using one of those to make it, and it doesn't boil the water because it's perfect for making coffee, they've taken tea down to here. A low quality, high priced drink. We have traded off, ladies and gentlemen, a situation where we used to have a high quality at a low price and a low quality at a low price, two acceptable situations, for one situation now where we have an acceptably expensive drink and a completely unacceptable drink in the bottom right-hand corner. What kind of trade-off is that? That is like sending your thick son to an expensive boarding school but making your intelligent daughter work as a prostitute to pay for it. <laughs> that is a ridiculous thing to have done. And that is how coffee has ruined tea. I rest my case, ladies and gentlemen. Now, something else has changed in the world of the tea drinker. You, you were a tea drinker, weren't you, sir? You were a tea drinker there, weren't you? Yeah. Uh, when you uh, make tea, are you a pot person or are you just tea bag in the mug? Tea bag in the mug. Tea bag in the mug. I think most people are these days. Um, if this was your brand of tea, and you know, I know other brands are available, I'm not recommending one at all, just as, it, as an example. Talk me through the process in which you make the tea. You take the bag out, put it in the mug. Yeah. yeah. And then I boil the kettle. Boil the kettle, yeah. Then when it's done, I pour the water in. And water in the, in the... And then do you mash it a bit? And, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. milk or not? You, milk. Milkman, yeah, OK. Uh, and at what point do you add a, a second bag to, to that? <laughs> you don't, you don't. Of course you don't, do you? Because that, that's how we all make tea, isn't it? We use one bag in a mug, we make a cup of tea with it. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. In which case, what the hell is that doing? <laughs> what are they doing bringing that out? That's not right, is it? That. If they're also releasing that onto the market, then doesn't that imply that that was in some way a bit wrong for one cup of tea? <laughs> Why have they been telling us to make a tea with one of these all these years if it isn't right? Is this too strong or is it too weak? What is it? All their adverts show them putting one of those in a mug as well. Was that wrong of us? Imagine going to the chemist to get your usual brand of condoms, <laughs> say Durex Extra Safe, and discovering that sitting right next to them on the shelf, there's a packet of Durex one bomb. <laughs> Three single-use condoms that are perfect for just one bonk. What message would that send out about the condoms you've been using up until now? That they're not good enough, that you should have been using them two or three times? Which, of course, you shouldn't. There are certain things that you just shouldn't meddle with. And we'll be talking about some of those after the break. To Modern Life is Goodish, I'm Dave Gorman, and we are talking, ladies and gentlemen, about the seemingly endless quest for improvement. The idea that everything can be improved is, I think, a fallacy. I think the skill in life is in spotting when we've peaked, when it's time to pull up stumps and settle for what you've got. But not everyone agrees with me. Everything can be improved. She can't actually mean everything, can she? And I mean everything. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Apparently she can. Although I'm really not convinced that deodorant adverts are a sensible place to look for your life philosophy. <laughs> Especially this particular advert, which contains this amazing piece of profound wisdom. We love to do things, it's part of our nature. <laughs> Let's just unpack that sentence for a moment, ladies and gentlemen. We love to do things, it's part of our nature. That's the thing that sets us apart from the animals. <laughs> Our love of doing things. <laughs> when you see two dogs frolicking in the park, you think, they're hating doing that thing, they are. We're the ones who like it. Could they not have been more precise than things? What things? What, well, genocide is a thing, isn't it? <laughs> no, exactly, exactly, they're wrong. We don't love doing that. I mean, really, are they sure about that? Are they sure? Yes, they are sure. They're sure, I know they're sure. <laughs> The thing is, deodorant is one of those things that I think has peaked. I think deodorant is as good as it's ever going to be, and that's great. But that's no use for advertisers, is it? Advertisers need you to believe that their product is better than it used to be, or that it's better than their competitors. That is the whole point of advertising. Otherwise, once it's reached perfection, all it is is a race to be the cheapest, and that's no good for business. That's why they make improvements to products. Improvements like this. 
Start your day right with new Right Guard Extreme, the first 48 hour antiperspirant. 48 hour antiperspirant? When did that one slip under the radar? What is the point of that 48 hour? If anyone in your social circle has ever uttered the words, I won't have a shower tonight, I put some deodorant on yesterday, <laughs> remove them from your social circle immediately. That is not the right way to behave. This is a plainly ridiculous sentence. Start your day right with new Right Guard Extreme, the first 48 hour antiperspirant. You can't start a sentence there and then go there immediately, can you? <laughs> that should say start two days right, shouldn't it? <laughs> Except if it did, we'd all be in our living rooms at home watching on telly thinking, hang on, that's not bloody right, that is. <laughs> you don't wear it for two days, that should say start two days wrong, shouldn't it, really? <laughs> Except that if it said two days wrong, you couldn't call it right guard extreme, could you? You'd have to call it extremely wrong guard. <laughs> Falls apart under any analysis. This isn't how science works, is it? If you were a scientist and your job was to make the 24-hour deodorant better, they gave you the formula and said, see what you can do, you wouldn't come out at lunchtime going, yeah, we've done it, it's twice as good, yeah, we've done it. You'd make tiny little improvements, when your little incremental increases. We've made it a little bit better, and another little bit better, and a little bit better. Why didn't they release any of those early versions to the market? Why did they go straight to 48? Why wasn't there a 25-hour deodorant for the day we put the clocks back? That would have been useful, wouldn't it? <laughs> no! The gung-ho fools! have gone straight to 48 like the idiots they are. Now, for some things, making them last longer is an improvement, but it doesn't hold true for everything, does it? I mean, it's true for light bulbs. A light bulb that lasts longer is a good thing. A deodorant, not. Yeah? I love the long-lasting light bulbs. It's a wonderful invention. It's great. But I do have issues with the way they were brought onto the market. Uh, I present to you, ladies and gentlemen, my light bulb timeline, as I remember it. Uh, if I'm right, I think I'm right in saying that it was in 1992 that they first became available in the mainstream to the public. And they released the long-lasting light bulb and they said, oh, it's wonderful, this. This could last you nine years. And in 1992, that was a wondrous thing. That was a revelation. Although you stop and think about it and hang on, how do they know that unless they actually invented it in 1983? <laughs> have they been waiting for the first one to fail? If so, they could have released this ages ago. Why not release it in 1990, for example, and say this one's going to last you at least seven years? That would have been good, wouldn't it? But they didn't bother with that. They just waited until 1992. And then we all got fussy. We, oh, I don't like this long-lasting light bulb. It takes too long to turn on. I, I want instant light. I'm not waiting three seconds in my own living room for light. <laughs> and so they worked at it. And eventually, they brought out a new, longer-lasting light bulb. In 1995, they brought the new, quick-to-turn-on light bulbs out, and these ones, they said, oh, they're brilliant. These could last you for 14 years. And that is superb news. Unless, like me, in 1995, you'd just bought a bulk load <laughs> of the bulbs they released in 1992. Because that means I've got to wait until 2004 to buy the technology that became available in 1995. <laughs> That's not a very good deal. Especially when you pause and think about it, oh, hang on, this new improved light bulb must have been invented in 1981. <laughs> They're ripping me off. They invented this first. They've been getting rid of all the shitty prototypes, haven't they? <laughs> Let them plug those in, let them trap themselves, they're environmentally conscious, they won't want to throw them away, let them buy a new one when we're ready. <laughs> now some things do get better and some things do get worse. That's what I'm saying. The point is in knowing when it's time to stop. That is the nub of the issue. Some things need to change. Some things, changing the shape, is a significant improvement. Not a tea bag, pyramid, round bags, who cares? Coins, they need to change, don't they? Yeah, money, it's a cat and mouse game. There are criminals out there trying to counterfeit money, so they need to stay ahead of the criminals. That's why they announced earlier this year that soon we will be getting a new one pound coin. In a couple of years, it's coming. Here's a story about it on the Mail Online. There it is on the BBC News website. There it is on the government's own website. As you can see, it's the same shape as the 12 sided three pence piece or the old thruppenny bit, as they used to call it. And some people, you think there's nothing to be upset about here. They're, you know, they're trying to beat the counterfeiters, but some people, they were upset. Of course they were, because some people. Fear change, yeah? yeah? <laughs> hey, now, come on, we talked about this! We talked about this! Do not judge me for that! I gave you a warning. I said I would be using the phrase fear change in a joke that I didn't want to do. I've got no choice. Look at it this way. There are two choices. You're going to get from A to B somehow. 
Okay? You could take two routes normally with A to B. You could go a sensible, straightforward, I'm just saying the exact words I mean, or you could go a funny route to say the same thing. Okay? In this particular instance, what I want to say is that some people are afraid when things change. And in this particular instance, one of the things that is changing is something that is commonly known as a piece of change. I am trapped in a quandary where both routes use exactly the same words, ladies and gentlemen. The point is that some people are afraid of change, okay? Fine. And I like it when people get upset. I like the people down there on the bottom half of the internet. I like to read what they're saying. I like to take their comments. I've done it with the comments from this particular story. I've turned them, ladies and gentlemen, into something that I like to call a found poem which I would like to perform for you now. Why, oh why, oh why, oh why, oh why <laughs> are they doing this? What do they hope to achieve? If you'd read the article, you would know they hope to achieve fewer forgeries. I see. Thank you. <laughs> Now I know what they hope to achieve. <laughs> they have made the Queen look very jowly. <laughs> I know she is old, but they could have been kinder. <laughs> Why don't they put a different face on the coin? <laughs> if it has to maintain a royal connection, why not Pippa? One thing is for sure, of that I can be certain. <laughs> this is going to cause havoc for the distribution of supermarket trolleys. <laughs> they can't have thought it through. <laughs> Arthur Cran! <laughs> Lol. <laughs> As someone who works in a shop but suffers from anxiety, I hate this idea. It makes me anxious. <laughs> you watch my words. When this new coin comes in, businesses will take advantage of the confusion and bring in lots of sneaky price rises. <laughs> They did it when they decimalised the currency, and they will do it again. <laughs> what? <laughs> what on earth are you on about? <laughs> How would that work? <laughs> it's not a new system of money. It's just a new coin. Fair play. <laughs> I have misunderstood the situation. <laughs> but even so, I wouldn't put it past them. <laughs> what about the trolleys? <laughs> How will we get trolleys? <laughs> this coin is ridiculous. It is categorically the ugliest thing I have ever seen. Ever. <laughs> Making the coin look so much like the old-fashioned thruppenny bit seems more than a little unwise. Don't they know what the thruppenny bit was rhyming slang for? <laughs> thruppenny bits equals breasts, for those who don't know. <laughs> Making a new coin look so much like an old coin that was rhyming slang for breasts is in very poor taste. <laughs> and I, for one, will simply not accept them. If we all do the same, they will have to change it back. They might as well just padlock all of the nation's supermarket trolleys together and say, that's it. There's no way of getting trolleys apart anymore. Which would be a ridiculous thing to say. But it's what they might as well be saying. I don't like coins with ridged edges. I never have, and I never will. The dirt collects there. 
I'm going to hold on to one of the old pound coins just in case. They might go out of circulation, but at least I will be able to get a trolley. <laughs> Gentlemen, I am Dave Gorman, and this, as the screen would suggest, is Modern Life is Goodish. Now, what we've been talking about is working out when to stop trying to improve, when we have peaked. Mankind's instinct is to keep improving things, to keep meddling with things. Now, you might think that if you bring order to chaos, you have naturally made an improvement. But I don't think that is always the case, because sometimes chaos is about creativity. And for some things, creativity is at the very core of their existence. For example, when I was a young child, Lego looked like that. That's all Lego was. That means go for your life, do what you want, build anything. The only thing holding you back is your imagination. Those days have gone as far as I can tell. Nowadays, Lego looks like that. <laughs> or like that. Or like that. And these things come with instructions. And when you've built one, you're hardly going to take it apart and do something else with it, are you? Because it's amazing. And these cost £100 there or thereabouts. Somebody made a brilliant film about just this issue. The people who made the film were Lego. <laughs> they made this the subject of the Lego movie. The plot is about the triumph of a child's imagination over a corporate world represented by an evil character called Lord Business. <laughs> The film is about a child that just wants to play with his Lego and his father who wants to build the sets and keep them just so as they are. And our sympathies as viewers are supposed to be with the child because Lego is supposed to look like that. And do you know what they did after that film? They brought out these 17 different play sets. <laughs> allowing you to recreate scenes from the film and leave them just so. I think a similar journey of removing the creativity has happened to dot-to-dot -dot books. When I was a child, I used to love a dot-to-dot -dot book. I loved it. I get lost for hours. You haven't quite got the penmanship, but you use your imagination. You don't know what it is when you start, and slowly the picture reveals itself. I bought these two books for my nieces for Christmas as a little stocking filler, and I was shocked at what has happened. This is what a dot-to-dot -dot should look like. You're not quite sure what it is, and you start filling it in, and slowly it emerges, and you think, all oh, right, I get it now. It's a slightly angular lion. I get it. <laughs> That's fine. And that was in these two books. But most of the others, they didn't have the same, the same unpredictable quality. That is taking the piss, isn't it? <laughs> That's also not the ice cream I would have given him. I'd have given him a Popeye, personally. I'd have... <laughs> I'd have thrown it at it, really. These things are ridiculous. Look at that. I, I've removed the dots from that to show you how complete the picture is. <laughs> that, without any dots on, is just a lovely picture of a schoolboy with his cap on, a jumper, no trousers and Wellington boots. <laughs> drawing, drawing water from a well. Nothing else going on. But no, apparently there are all these dots. <laughs> and look, you know that's complete, don't you, if you take them away? This is ridiculous. Look at that. You've done the whole table tennis match. You've done the skipping child. You've left them one of the four children to fill in some of the details. And that is definitely wrong. <laughs> that's rude. But, ladies and gentlemen, there is a place still where creativity reigns supreme. In my opinion, that place is Kickstarter. Kickstarter is a wondrous thing. If you don't know about it, basically, it's a way to start a project of your own. It could be a creative one, it could be a business one, all these different fields that you can do it in. It could be art, it could be design, it could be technology. The idea is, you put some money in, but they don't take the money unless they've reached their funding. So they might say, oh, we need £20,000 to make this happen, and unless they get the 20000 nobody loses any money. If they do get the 20000 they get to do what they want to do, and the people who gave them the money get some rewards for it. So everyone's a winner. It's a good idea, OK? You get some big success stories. These people had a new watch. They were looking for $100,000. That's what they were looking for. They got 68 
8,929 people backing them, and in total, they raised 10 million, 10 million dollars for that. Well done them. And then at the other end of the scale, you've got people like this. This guy wants to raise 110 pounds <laughs> so that he can buy a Chewbacca costume and sing a song on YouTube. <laughs> And good luck to him, I say. Both of those things are lovely, and I wish them all the well in the world. Good for them. There are also some people who don't seem to realise that they have been beaten to the punch, that somebody else has got there first. This is an idea I like, I just think he's been beaten to it. It's a, it's a Lego film called Doug and the Meaning of Life. And as you can see, it says down here, it's a guy called Malhar who's running this, and he says it's a stop-motion Lego film. Instead of the short comedy sketches, typically on YouTube, this is a professional full-length serious drama. And you think, how am, how am I going to break it to him that there was this big movie <laughs> called the Lego Movie? <laughs> They've definitely got there first. Maybe he doesn't know. And anyway, how is this going to be possible? How much money will this cost? I mean, on the page, he hasn't put a video up. He just says, video coming soon. And he's put this photo up, and you know, a little bit out of focus of a minifig. And you think, I don't know. It's, it's not really inspiring confidence. I mean, this must be a hugely expensive undertaking. The Lego movie costs $60 million. And they didn't even do stop motion animation. As he explains here, stop motion animation is a painstaking and difficult process. Hundreds of thousands of photos. If this film is an hour, we are talking more than 86,000 photos to animate it smoothly. So how much is this man looking for for a full-length stop-motion Lego film? This man is looking for £625. <laughs> when I found this out, he had no backers, and this was the final day of his search. No one's got on board. I'm not sure why, but no one's got on board. These are his pledges, if you, if you get behind him. Six pounds, your name in the closing credits as an important backer supporter of the film. For 15 pounds, exclusive behind the scenes video about the production of the movie. 20 pounds, digital copies of all three drafts of the script. Soundtrack and score for 30 pounds. If you pledge 100 pounds or more, you get a first edition DVD signed by the cast and crew. <laughs> yeah. Who doesn't want that guy's autograph, ladies and gentlemen? Absolutely, it's tempting, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm looking at this. He's got no backers. It's the final day. He wants £625. I'm thinking he's probably missed a couple of noughts off there. He probably wanted 60 grand or more. He's probably sitting at home thinking, please don't fund the movie. I've got to make it for £625 if I do. And I thought, you know what? Look, it's April the 1st. <laughs> and I thought, you know, for a laugh, it's April the 1st. What I might do is put in quite a lot of money so that he sees he came close and feels encouraged but no money will go from my credit card because he won't quite get there. Huh? Not being cruel, it just sort of be nice. It's better than getting nothing anyway, isn't it? It's better than saying that literally nobody backed your project. It's got to be better. So I went on Kickstarter and I chipped in £624. And I thought, it's April the 1st, he'll see what I'm doing, Malhar will have a wonderful time when he sees that, he'll have a little giggle and it'll be fine. And it's not going to cost me anything, so it's a free little joke, it's going to brighten up his day. And I went on my way and my phone beeped and I looked down and I had an email. An email from Kickstarter telling me they'd taken £624 <laughs> off my credit card. Well, that's not how Kickstarter's supposed to work. I went straight back on the site to complain where I discovered he now had two backers. <laughs> And £639! Somebody else has come along and chipped in £15. There's the backers. There's me. I've backed one other project. There's Gwinnale. He's backed 2,041 other projects. What was he doing? And this is important. I want you to understand this. The money came in in this order. I went on. Nobody put any money in. By the time I got my money in, Gwinnell had already put his in. So he waited until there were five minutes left. He knows the target is 625 and then no one has put any money in. And he thinks, I'll chip in 15 quid. What's he doing? <laughs> five minutes and a clock ticking down, you're putting 15 pounds into a pot the size of 625 pounds. He must have been thinking, I'll get my money straight back. It's a, who's going to come in and put 625? He must be furious with me. <laughs> Because I've cost him 50 quid. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm furious with Gwinnale. Because he's cost me 624. And do you know who the person I think is most upset by this? It's probably Malhar, who's shitting himself. Because he's now got to make a full-length feature film out of Lego for 639 pounds. 
And I don't think £639 is enough money to buy a camera, an actor for a day of voiceover. It's not enough money to buy the bloody Lego, is it? <laughs> Oh, we got into a bit of a Mexican standoff there. I put the money in, it was a joke, and then it's gone wrong, and now I think he might think I'm cruel. And I'm waiting for an email from Malhar, and, and a week or two goes by, and I thought, I don't know what to do. So eventually, I sort of got in touch with him, sent him an email myself, and said, look, I was sort of joking when I put the money in. I was expecting it to get, come back to me, because I didn't think you'd get the target, and I, I wasn't being cruel. And now that you've got it, you're very welcome to it, and that's fine. Um, but as the producer of your film... Um, <laughs> And what else can you call yourself when you are the 97% stakeholder <laughs> in the film? As the producer, I'm interested, what are you actually going to do next? And he came back and said, well, you know, it's going to be a little while and it's going to take some time, but I am doing it and this is genuine. And, and I did want 625, not 62,500 or whatever. Uh, and I thought, oh God, this is, can't be, this can't be possible, can it, for one man to do that? And then all of a sudden he sent me a message with a, a link to a website that he created for the film. And you'd seen the photo on the Kickstarter, and I thought, oh, it's, it's going to be more like that. And I went, and actually, that's, that's bloody nice, that, isn't it? That's decent. You've got to give him credit for that. That's quite nicely put together. And the photos, little gallery, they're quite nice. That's quite cinematic. There's a kind of depth of field of that first character there, not in focus, and then that one who is. That's nice. I like that. And I felt a bit guilty, because in context of it actually happening, the £624 looks like a bit of a dick move basically. It looks like I'm being a bit cruel, and that wasn't the idea. So I wanted to be encouraging, and I got back in touch with Malhar, and I said, look, I know I was joking at first, but, you know, it's all good. Can I help in any way? Um, if you're interested, I am a performer. If you want me to do one, I will do a voice in the movie. And he said, well, you can audition. <laughs> and I've got to audition. And he sent me a clip from the film, and I'll tell you what, I'm going, to, I'm going to be completely open with you, I've met him since, he's a genuinely lovely guy, and he's here tonight, because this is my audition, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> he's down there, hello Malhar, very good to see you, genuinely. And I, absolutely. I genuinely apologise, because I was sort of taking the piss, but like, you, you are serious, you are going to make this for 620, you are? I am. You are? I okay. Am. How is that possible? It's difficult, <laughs> but it's possible. <laughs> and I'm going to show you, you, you sent a little clip of, from the film, and, and it's, it's brilliant, because there's a lovely joke at the end of this, I want to play a little section just to show that this man can genuinely animate in Lego, it's a brilliant thing. That is good. That is good. Exactly. Brilliant, mate. Right, now, Malhar, I know that I'm going to play the bit where my line is, uh, potentially my line. There are two characters in this bit. There's this guy and there's this guy. <laughs> and I'm guessing that's... OK, I'm going to... I'm a method actor, so I'm... Um... <laughs> Do it in, in, in character. Uh, what, what's the line, Malha? Um, it's, hey, looks like you're becoming a regular. Hey, looks like you're becoming a regular. And, and my own voice, that's OK for you? That... Try a Californian accent, if you can. <laughs> Put the glasses on. Character. Hey, bro. Hey, looks like you're something of a regular. I know I said something instead of becoming, but that's because I'm just, I freeform. That is, <laughs> is that okay? He doesn't look like I've got the part, to be honest with you. He's, <laughs> he's looking less than thrilled. Malha, can I please, genuinely, can I have a part in the film? Yeah, go on. Yes! Yeah! ladies and gentlemen, means that I have spent £624 on a DVD that I can sign myself. <laughs> That's what I've done there. 
And if that bit of April the 1st shopping doesn't prove that modern life is goodish, then I don't know what does. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again. Good night.